are the 80s. It was a time of shoulder pads, break dancing, music and cool TV. It was a time of Reagan, Thatcher and Gorbachev, Jedis, aliens and time machines. Come with me as we bring back the glory years in this 80s retro revival. Hi all, welcome to the first of the series of the 80s Retro Revival. Uh, I thought, you know, I'd make a retro corner over here uh, and I need to fill it with loads of things from my favourite era because it's the era I was brought up in, the 80s. As you can see, it's looking a little bit bare at the moment though, but as these videos go on, you can imagine it's going to get pretty busy behind here. So much so I may have to uh, move into a new man cave. Uh, but today I thought we'd focus on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Now, when I wasn't on my BMX or playing out with my friends and having to come in when the street lights turned on, uh, I was playing with this little bad boy. And believe me, this got a lot of hours of playtime. This is the actual one that I had when I was a kid. Uh, obviously, since then, I had a few of the other models, but I kept this one uh, just for nostalgia reasons. But let me tell you a little bit about it. The ZX Spectrum spawned from the original releases of Sinclair's ZX80 and ZX81, which were initially sold in kit form. In fact, during development, the Spectrum was known as the ZX81 Color or the ZX82. The first 16K Spectrum hit the UK in April 1982. Roughly the same time, Commodore 64s were being released in all the homes in the US. This explains why the Spectrum market was already established over here in the UK before the influence of the Commodore 64 started to enter people's homes. The ZX Spectrum was just over £100 at its release uh, and had rubber keys and its trademark rainbow motif. It has 16K of ROM memory and an audio line in and out port so software could be loaded from cassette tape media using a standard 3.5 inch jack. The 48K Plus naturally evolved from the original model in 1984, which changed the rubber keyboard to a more standard one. In 1985, the 128K was developed, which not only gave extra memory but had an improved sound chip which increased the sound capabilities of the machine. This model had no internal speaker, the sound now came through the TV it was connected to. From there we had a couple of versions of the Plus 2 which came with a tape deck, it was at this time that Amstrad had taken over the Sinclair brand. And finally we had the Plus 3 Spectrum which came with a disk drive that surprisingly used Amstrad's 3 inch floppy disks. Now if you thought pre-broadband speeds were slow you haven't seen nothing yet, we had to use a cassette tape put it in a cassette player and download the data to the Spectrum and you'd be greeted with this. Believe me, that noise will haunt me for the rest of my life. And the reason being is because after 10 minutes of watching these lovely patterns on the screen and occasionally getting a nice picture to look at while it's downloading, you'd have the problem that either the game loads and you can play the game or it doesn't and you get this stupid R-tape loading error. That happened, you had to rewind the tape all the way back to the beginning and start all over again. Now apart from the games which I'll tell you about in a minute, you could actually get peripherals for the ZX Spectrum. Believe it or not you could get a printer which would plug into the bus board at the back of the computer. Uh, you could get a device which would enable you to use a joystick. Uh, the joystick at the time was a Kempston joystick I think I was using and here's a picture of one now. Uh, you also used to get something called a Multiface 3. Now this was only available really for the Plus 3 Spectrum and what it enabled you to do was to take a complete memory dump of a game and save it to disk. And what was the advantage of that? It meant no more loading screens. You could load the game directly from a disc. Unfortunately, it also enabled people to pirate games, which wasn't very good, was it? And it's the games, it's the games that it was all about. I don't know what Clive Sinclair thought when he bought the when he bought this out, whether he thought you were gonna learn the basic programming language and uh, you know create some sort of brilliant thing that can solve all sort of problems. No, everyone bought it to play the games. But what games did you want to buy? Because believe me, there were some right turkeys out there. Now it wasn't just a war that was going on between the home computers of things like Commodore and Spectrum, there was also a war in the publishing world, especially on the ZX Spectrum. You had two magazines from what I remember, actually there's three, but I'm going to focus on the two big ones, which was Your Sinclair, absolutely brilliant magazine, but nowhere near as good as Crash. And you knew what games you were going to buy because you're looking for the coveted Crash Smash. These were all the games that you just had to buy and uh, everyone had rated absolutely perfectly. So believe me, I focused on the Crash Magazine monthly to see what games I'd buy for this. Games at the time, from what I remember, were around about £7.99. 
Now, the ZX Spectrum didn't have the best graphics in the world, let that be said. Now, they had something called the attribute problem, and that is, if you can imagine a character screen, say the letter A, is made up of eight pixels by eight pixels, they could only ever have two colors in those pixels. If they tried to have three, then the color would bleed into the surrounding uh, pixels, which was really bad. For that reason, the uh, developers had to get very inventive with their loading screens and their graphics. Uh, let me show you some examples of some of the loading screens here, you can see uh, they have to basically have minimal color and color in certain areas so that they don't bleed into opposite areas. Now on a loading screen they can be a lot more creative with that but unfortunately during the games they couldn't which is one of the reasons why on the ZX Spectrum most of the games were in a monochrome. Now one of the biggest memories you'll have of any of these old consoles is the 8-bit sound. Now believe me or not the music for this can go from dire to when it got to the 128k uh, spec uh, a little bit better music. Music. and actually there's some quite memorable themes I can think of and I'm going to show you those uh, in a little bit when I show you some of the gameplay. I think what I'll do is I'll show you my top five games uh, which were my favourite to play uh, back in the 80s. Uh, but did you know that you could get speech synthesised on the spectrum? I'm going to show you two clips here. The first one is from Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters! <laughs> and this one is Robin of the Wood. And I think that will give you an idea of what the speech capabilities were of an 8-bit machine. Okay, so before we end this video, I can't go without showing you my top five games. And these are basically the games that I played in the 80s. It doesn't necessarily mean the most popular ones, okay? First off, we have a 1987 release of Flying Shark by Firebird. <laughs> And next up we have Jet Set Willy which was released in 1984 by Software Projects. In third place a big favourite 1984's Hypersports by Konami. One of my absolute favourite games by Microsoft in 1985, it was the sequel to School Days, Back to School. And the last game, number one, which I used to play all the time, although it was coming towards the end of the ZX Spectrum's life, it was the 1988 release from Imagine, it was Target Renegade. So look, I really hope you like that trip down memory lane. There's going to be more of these things to come because I do want to fill up my retro corner back there. So the, I'm putting it to you now. What would you like to see me review? It doesn't have to be items. It could be films. It could be music. It could be an item. It could be computers. It could be whatever you want. Uh, put it in the comments there and I'll try and collate them together and try and get some of these things in. I'll tell you now, I've got some things on the way. I've got a Tomitronics, if you remember that, a uh, little 3D sky attack game. I've got a Rubik's Cube coming. I've obviously got Gizmo over there to do and a Nintendo Game Boy, which only just gets into the 80s because that was released in 1989, but not in this country. Uh, but yeah, I want your ideas. So tell me what you think of this video. Put it in the comment. If you did like this video, please remember to give it a like. And if you haven't done so already, please remember to subscribe. Other than that, take care. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please remember to give it a like. And if you haven't done so already, please remember to subscribe. Take care.